First off, good morning from New York City um, and welcome to all of you joining us today. I'm Alice Eckstein. I'm program manager at United Nations University Center for Policy Research uh, for the Modern Slavery Program, and that includes Delta 8.7. Uh, Delta 8.7 seeks to identify what works to achieve sustainable development goal target 8.7 and end modern slavery, human trafficking, forced labor, and child labor. Our website serves as the global knowledge platform for the Alliance 8.7. We examine effective measures. And at the end of this month, we'll release three policy guides on what current research suggests might work in the domains of justice, markets, and crisis to end modern slavery. And we also look at effective measurements, the ways in which we understand prevalence and vulnerability as we seek to reduce these numbers. Today, we're going to take a closer look at measurements and measures. I imagine that all of you who have joined us are aware that over 40 million people today are estimated to be living in conditions of modern slavery, with women and girls making up a significant majority of that number, currently estimated at around 71%. There have been excellent reports on why women and girls are more likely to be in these conditions. We talk about gender bias, certainly. But in what we want to do today, is also talk about gender bias and how we measure modern slavery. As statisticians, enumerators, activists, policymakers, frontline responders, gender bias within society and our assumptions about gender can affect how modern slavery is identified and thus how it's responded to. Starting last week and ending on Monday, Delta 8.7 presented an online symposium featuring contributions on this topic. I'm going to assume you've all read it, or at least will read it after this panel, so we're not going to fully repeat that symposium today. But four of our contributors have very graciously agreed to come together and talk a bit more about this topic. I'm really honored to be joined today by these amazing researchers. We have with us Davina Durgana, Senior Statistician at the Walk Free Foundation and co-author of their Global Slavery Index. Natalia Suzuki, the coordinator of Slavery No Way at Reporter Brazil. Juno Fitzpatrick, director of Human Rights and Oceans for Conservation International. And Caroline Adiambo, a survivor leader and researcher working in Kenya. Now, this is a rich topic and there's much to discuss, so we're going to get right to it. I'm going to start with a round of questions for each panelist and may follow up with one additional question, but we wanna hear from you in the audience too. So after each has spoken a bit about their work in this context, we'll open up for more conversation and questions. Please use the Q&A function throughout this event to submit your thoughts and questions for the panel. And one other general note, this session is being recorded. So if you have colleagues or friends who missed today's event, we will be posting a link to watch later. Okay, so I'm going to start with a general question for everyone um, and on how they first came to see gender bias reflected in their work on modern slavery and the impact of that on their work. Um, I'm going to start with you, Davina. Um, you're leading some of the most influential research on prevalence at Walk Free. Um, I know we're all looking forward to the next Global Estimates report. Um, and you work with a variety of data sources. So tell us more about how you've seen gender bias affect the collection of data. Yes, thank you, Alice. And thank you for hosting this amazing symposium and panel. You are such a leader in our field for these questions at the innovative edge of what's going on in terms of measurement and um, improving iterative improvement in all of these areas. So yes, absolutely. We are very eagerly and hungrily pursuing our next global estimates and our next global slavery index. Um, one of the interesting things is that gendered um, disruptions to our measurement are, are ubiquitous. And, and that's partially what you'll see from our contributions to the symposium. But to note, you know, even with the data we've done to date, 
we also know that we can do better in terms of measuring forced marriage in particular, and specifically mm -hmm. in certain countries and regions of the world like the Gulf states, for example. And so this next um, iteration of the Global Estimates and the Global Slavery Index will include some firsthand research um, really diving deep into the experiences of not just return migrant workers from the Gulf states, but also experiences of forced marriage, which as we know is highly gendered and particularly following the COVID-19 epidemic, we're going to have a significant impact on women and girls and specifically the rates of forced and child marriage that have occurred as they've been kept out of school for prolonged periods of time. Um, we've this this year we've published um, our stacked odds report that looks at specifically how gender has impacted specific risk to modern slavery of women and girls at every stage of their life, starting at conception and son preference and what that means for women and girls through um, preferential access to primary education. And then again, all the way to the end to late adulthood and the lack of land tenure rights and the ability to retain property in their husband's names after their death. So this is a really pervasive issue. And I think for our community, there are just some really simple ways that aren't exactly always the most exciting policy discussions, but start at the very, very minutia level of data collection, where we're talking about administrative data centers. We're talking about census data collection. We're talking about how we define gender, how we think about these demographics, because without collecting that information at the beginning, we won't be able to analyze it at the end. And so it's a really exciting time because we can actually have these discussions and, and pull these partners in in ways that we haven't before. Great, thank you. And, and I will say that um, I love the little technical details, so we'll probably return to some of those in a minute. But um, for now, turning to uh, Natalia, um, you know, you work in the specific context of Brazil, and your studies have shown that how labor is defined and understood is quite gendered. Can you say more about what you found and what it means for understanding the scale of forced labor and human trafficking? Yes, sure, Alice. Thank you for all this organization, for this event. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be part of this debate with my colleagues and to approach these two issues, gender and slave labor together. It's very important, it's very urgent. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, only 5% of the total number of people rescued from slave labor are women. And this small proportion call, called our attention. Once we know previously that generally uh, there are huge gender differences in labor markets. Uh, for instance, women are one of the first group of being unemployed in a situation of economic crisis. Uh, they receive lower salaries in comparison with men and they are the major part of the total of informal workers here in Brazil. So why in this radical context of exploitation, uh, such as slave labor, women are so underrepresented as victims? So uh, we had two main reflections. First, the real number of female victims in Brazil may be underrepresented. Uh, in Brazil, many women under slave labor are dedicated to domestic and sexual work. And these kinds of labor activities usually are not recognized as work that generates labor rights, profit, value, and that is why they must be paid, supposedly. Uh, there are a lot of prejudice and stigma regarding to these women uh, that have to do with gender issues, of course. And sometimes even the responsible authorities have a hard time to identify and classify these women as workers, as victims. Uh, so the consequence of this is that many cases are not reported as slave labor in official data, but mainly women are not repaired for the violation that they suffered. And second reflection, we did not pay attention to understand who are these women. Uh, even if they are just 5% of the total of the victims, uh, we have few information about them so far. So where do they come from? What do we know about their age, race, educational level? What types of labor were they engaged in when they were found in situation of slavery? Um, these are some questions that motivate our program to disaggregate uh, national data and go further to see what we can get in terms of the profile of these women. And besides, we know that official data usually capture national average, but they, all, the, they often uh, mask specific elements at, at the subnational context. Um, so when we disaggregate national data, we are, realize that in some places we have a different proportion in terms of numbers, uh, from those national ones. Uh, 
so it's very tricky, actually. And this information leads us to understand that there are so many levels of vulnerability and profiles that are undercovered. Um, once we always consider women as a minority, a very small part of the universe of victims in Brazil, uh, we have not developed public policies uh, dedicated to address gender issues in the context of slave labor in our country. So things like pregnancy, maternity, uh, domestic violation, uh, sexual abuse are often not considered in the design and implementation of our policies. Um, this lack of specific assistance uh, makes them even more likely to be exploited again. And this is very problematic, of course, because in the end of the day, we are reinforcing equality through public policies. It's very, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to go on, to evaluate and to uh, progress if we continue to see data in this way. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, one of the things that um, your article really brought out for me is how um, frequently labor uh, enumerator statisticians don't consider the family nature of migrant labor and forced labor that frequently spouses or, or partners will accompany a migrant um, into a condition of forced labor, and they're not always counted either. And so that was um, a really valuable perspective and, and one that I'd love to, to follow up more on later. Um, but for now, let me turn to Juno. Um, now, your work at Conservation International isn't within a specific region or country. Um, you have done a deep dive into the seafood sector, and I'm aware that's a terrible pun. I, I apologize. Um, but your article noted that focus on human rights violations in that sector leaves out gender specific impacts and also misses opportunities for intervention. So, you know, I'd love to hear more about how you came to be aware of gender bias as a blind spot in fisheries and what impact that's having on your work on human rights and oceans. Thanks, Alice. It's great to be with you and all of these incredible women this morning. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic question. Uh, what, what's interesting um, for Conservation International and, and multiple environmental NGOs is that over the last decade, the seafood sector has been so focused on driving environmental sustainability and focusing on the, the ecological impacts of their fisheries. And it was only in 2015, 2016, following the Associated Press and The Guardian that released media revelations about human rights violations happening within the seafood sector, that industry and NGOs started to take note of this nexus of human rights abuses within supply chains. So focus has been on vessels that are at sea, they're transshipping they're, they're trans fish, there's very little visibility and opacity within the supply chains. But interestingly, much of the media focus has concentrated on civil and political rights and labor abuses at sea. And the at sea portion of fishery supply chains are predominantly men in industrialized scenarios. And what is left out of the conversation or only briefly touched upon is the condition of women. So the seafood sector um, literature states that it is male dominated, but women intensive. Half of the sector is women and 18 to 90% of the seafood sector, the processing segment of the supply chain, the land-based activities is women. And so we've noticed that while there's been an incredible um, effort in the last five to six years from industry, NGOs and governments alike to really improve and, and better recognize this nexus of human rights violations and environmental exploitation, we need to consider who's left out of that conversation and what demographic. And so we find that women in processing segments of the supply chain that are gleaning fish and doing other post-production activities, there needs to be better policies that are the better support and safeguard their rights, whether they're economic, social, and cultural rights 
supporting their food security, their livelihood security, and other social protections. Alice, I think you might be muted. Oh, uh, it's, a, it's a Zoom trope by this point. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, going to Caroline, uh, you're working as a researcher and you noted some really important ways that gender bias results in undercounting people of all genders. And you found that traditional expectations regarding gender and behavior can increase the vulnerability um, and also make people of all genders less likely to seek or receive support um, in conditions of exploitation. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you found, um, including what that means for, for men and boys? First of all, thanks Alice for the opportunity and for everyone else who's on this platform. And as you've mentioned, um, Kenya specifically and most African countries are countries that are ruled by culture. We are cultural people and most of us choose to stick, to be sticklers to whatever cultural practices we found before. So sometimes um, out of experience or out of normalcy, people, people don't find these things to be exploitation at first. They think, they think it's a norm because that's the way things have already been done. It's okay for a girl to be married early after mutilation. It's okay for a woman to just be married off to someone who's raped them in, in an effort or in bid to try protect the family name. It's also bad for a man to complain or it's unexpected because the society has taught us that men are supposed to be macho. You, you, you're brought up and you're structured to know that you're the one to continue the lineage of a family. So down that path, you're not supposed to complain. When you receive whatever, whatever challenges you come across, you're expected to man up. So you find that in such circumstances, our boys and our men don't have enough platforms to talk. When you talk or when you speak up, they tell you you're less of a man or it's just unexpected. So people don't embrace it. And in most times, the boys feel as though uh, instead of coming out and be pro being protected as victims, sorry, they're, less, they're left feeling like it was wrong for them to talk. And though most of the victims you already have are women and children, I feel that there's a gap because we've often viewed our men as the perpetrators. So I feel like there's a gap and sometimes our boys are forgotten or left behind. But at the same time, it's not like women are, are still totally protected from being, from being victimized or re-victimized because some of them don't speak up about the, the things that they go through. They've been told to be sub, sub, subservient or sorry, sub, submissive. You're not supposed to talk when a, when a woman is talk, when a man is talking, or they tell you to be like the Proverbs 31 woman the ideal woman but do we really have an ideal woman do we really have an ideal platform for this ideal woman to talk about the things they go through some women are raped on a daily basis but when you're raped your family works together with your perpetrator and marries you off trying to protect their name some boys are sodomized in the name of getting scholarships or being able to be provided for by your benefactors, but you're not able to speak out because your family is afraid that in doing so, and yet you come from poor or less privileged backgrounds, they lose whatever little help they're getting from their benefactors. So I think they, they choose to sacrifice whatever experiences women and sometimes even children or boys go through for the sake of the help. Sometimes you're told to, it's not a big deal, it's a trend. These things happen. People try to make it seem as though it's a norm, but it's not a norm because it stays with some, it stays with someone. No matter how culturally, I think no matter how culturally influenced we are, 
some things are more than just culture. Some things are, some things are just, they just call them wrong. And uh, as it is, or as communities are structured, as people are structured, we are a patriarchal, we are a patriarchal society. And even yesterday, I saw someone tweet on Twitter that women deserve bare minimum. This is someone who's passing on a message that as a woman or as a girl, and it's actually maybe someone who has a sister or a mother or a friend who's a woman, passing a message that we as women deserve a bare minimum. When you go to be employed by someone who has the same mentality, trust me whether you're qualified than your counterparts or not, you'll, get, you'll not get equal treatment no matter how justified you are to get better pay, you won't get better pay because they already have these constructed ideas that you don't deserve it. You're not fitting despite your qualifications, despite of your capabilities. To them, you're not fitting. It's a patriarchal nation. The man rules the world. So you deserve a bare minimum just because you're a woman. And as much as I think the policies are there, I think most of them also tend to leave out the voices of most of the people who are affected. And most of the people who, who are victims who are not able to get platforms to speak because of such constructed, uh, consti constructed ideas or notions because at the end of the day, you're trying to protect yourself. The society expects you to achieve some things. It's a norm. So people embrace it, even when it's wrong. People just try to make do. They don't talk about it, because when you talk about it, who'll understand? Who'll embrace you and tell you that, I get you, I believe you, and it happened. So I think to most people, especially where, Patriarchy is practiced, especially where there are cultural restrictions, be it a boy, be it a girl, be it a man, be it a woman. I think most people or some people are not able to come out and say exactly what they're going through. That also makes you question the statistics that we have. Because if we have this cluster of people who are not able to speak up, if we have this cluster of people who are not able to, to raise their voice, who are not able to tell anyone what they're going through because of structures. Then these numbers that you're already using, how sure are we that they're reflecting the true picture on the ground? Yeah, yeah I mean, thank, thank you so much. I, I think that you um, just raised so many rich points, um, including sort of intersections around social and economic vulnerability and how families in um, a natural desire to protect themselves and, and protect the members of their families can fall into these practices. Um, and that cultural expression is not the same thing as um, these forms of exploitation and violence. Um, so I, I thank you for that. And I, I think um, we'll have a lot more questions about this um, to come. But um, I have a few questions that we've already received from the audience. And thank you so much for sending them in. Keep them coming. These are some great questions. And a couple of the questions have to do with education and education gaps. Um, these are for all of you. Um, somebody specifically asked about education in Brazil, and I'm taking this as questions about, um, and also vulnerability to child labor. And I'm wondering if you find that uh, measurements of child labor are more complicated or difficult or schooling because of gender bias, because of the ways that, that um, girls are expected to engage in education in some contexts. Um, and, and how that works. So maybe um, Natalia, if I could just start with you because there was a specific question about um, whether you're measuring education gaps in Brazil and then turn it over to anybody else who wants to jump in. Uh, 
Uh, yes, of course. Thanks for the question. Uh, our research show, showed us that there is a lack of education uh, in terms of these uh, victims, of course, and we found that 20% of these women had, have no education at all. They, they never went to school. Uh, 42% uh, have low education, so they just have uh, more uh, less than five years of education, formal education. So more than 60% of these women uh, practically have no education at all. So of course, this has to do with, with qualification, professional qualification, of course, and the chances of, of getting better, uh, better jobs. So there's a great connection between education and slave labor here in Brazil. So that's why it's so important to guarantee um, education for girls since the very recent ages, because uh, we are going to have impact in the future, in the next generation, of course. Um, one of the things I was going to say, too, is that, you know, Caroline's points are so, so powerful, especially when we're thinking about conceptions of victimhood, how we deal with toxic masculinity in the context of all of this work and how we validate all survivors, all voices, as we continue to, to still maintain that there are substantial differences in the lived experience of all women that make them a, more structurally vulnerable in some ways to certain types of servitude. And, and as Natalia mentioned earlier, of course, and, and Juno, there are certain industries we work in where female participation is significantly higher. I mean, domestic servitude is another one of those examples. We've got I mean, you've got textiles, even some forms of agriculture. I mean, it's really, it's really confounding because one of the challenges is that we we do tend to understand forced labor in the context of this gendered perspective, and that is hugely problematic when we're missing a lot of these populations. I see in the Q and A that Ben um, Harris had a question that was uh, directed towards Natalia about this question about uh, underreported survivor victims, and I think that speaks to what Caroline was speaking to as well. But specifically in terms of data scientists and how we maintain inclusive and how we, we combat this. Honestly, I don't know that we have yet had enough of those conversations in terms of understanding the dynamics because truthfully the challenge is everyone on this panel has a unique role at the intersection of policy and data science, right? That means that we do research, we understand what this looks like but we also influence policy because of the way that our roles are constructed. This is a very different situation from people who are only involved in data collection at the very early stages. And we're missing a step here. We're missing a bridge between explaining how that level of data collection in, in the municipal county house or the, the little village, that matters at the end of the day to the global policy we're making. And we, we need to do a better job. I need to do a better job of communicating that to our partners because we have a lot of limitations. I mean, even in the US Census, we are not yet inclusive in terms of how we talk about any part of a personal identity. We don't really understand how to talk about race. We don't understand how to talk about maternal languages and, and um, legacy of immigration, especially in the US context, which would have a tremendous impact on the demographic information that guides so much of our policy and political discussions. And we definitely don't have a nuanced understanding of non-binary genders. We don't understand this concept of gender expression being different than sexual preference and gender orientation at, and then gender assigned at birth. I mean, these are all things that are really critical because when we don't allow for space for this, we make assumptions about the, the categories that people fit into. And then we make policy on the basis of those assumptions that is not as responsive as it needs to be for what needs to happen in the real world. So this is a really dynamic and an important discussion to be having. And I think um, not forgetting the survivor voice in this is really critical because of course, when, I, when I'm doing our survey research, when we're thinking about questions and how we talk to people in the public about modern slavery, it is critical that we have we take into account how societies have gendered modern slavery. It is it is omnipresent that South Asian workers who are exploited in the Gulf genuinely see a lot of the intergenerational exploitation that they've experienced to be normalized because that's how their parents made that's how their fathers and uncles and brothers made money and this becomes like a normal thing. And I I think it's an interesting thing that if we don't if we don't take this into account deliberately we will never be able to legislate or promote policy on this at the other end. So it's, 
it's a disconnect. It's a disconnect in the continuum of how data is processed, how data informs policy. And I think that's an obligation on all of us that work on policy to make sure that we we're, we're engaging on this specific issue. If I can just add to what you've said, and I think social injustices um, are to blame to some point because people at times don't even know that whatever they're doing is actually slave trade or they're being exploited to, to some extent. People are just trying to make a living. People are just trying to earn a living and it's been a cycle. You're being overworked and underpaid and abused, but because this is what you have to do to survive, these are the options you have at the moment. So people don't, to them, it's a norm. To them, they don't think that I'm actually being exploited. I'm actually being abused by this person. To them, it's like, I'm trying to earn a living. I'm, I'm luckier than the person who has nothing to do. So if you, if you talk to them about it, they'll just think you're not seeing things from their angle. But in real sense, they're going through something that they may not have any idea about or they may know exactly what they're going through, but because of the circumstances of life, you just they just make peace with it. And to them, it becomes a new normal, which should actually not be the case. Yeah, so, you know, I guess turning to the next question is, how do we solve this problem? I'm sure there's just a really simple answer. But you know what I'm really thinking about is um, you know how and some of these are are some uh, questions that have come up in our Q and A is um, around improving data collection. So what is it that governments need to do in their administrative data? And I think Davina, you've uh, touched upon that a little bit. But also, how can we better resource the people who are collecting data and the people who are in the position to give and provide data? So what's, what are your takes on this in the various sort of areas that you work on? Uh, thanks all, I can kick us off and then I think everyone probably has something to say, but Sophie Otiende, um, great colleague, great um, well-respected leader in the field, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your question about how do we bridge this gap, That's exactly what Alice was um, reiterating, but also the fact that we need to acknowledge there is a hegemonic control of all data, scholarship, academics, bias towards Western education and English. This is a reality of how information and data is published. It's a reality of how data science performs at a global level. And it's something we're actively combating against. I mean, myself, I'm, I'm fluent in French and Spanish. And I'm telling you that even as an academic, publishing in those languages is significantly more challenging in any of our fields than it is when you have options in English, let's say. But there isn't one international standard for scientific communication, or, or yet there shouldn't be. And we certainly are losing a lot by being unable to communicate in local languages on these issues. And so one of the things that we have to do, and especially Mindaro and Walk Free, when we look at this as a potential funding organization, what we look at is having to build data capacity as a, a critical part of any of the work that we do. So for our multiple systems estimation projects in Europe, we include money to allow the governments we work with to build data infrastructure, meaning that they then, in the process of, of collaborating with us, getting the information that we need, in their own languages, in their own systems, they are creating data capacity to continue to generate the information used in the initial estimates that we can then replicate again. And actually we've had some great success in, in some of the prior governments we've worked with being interested in reanalyzing new data and, and being able to take more autonomy in that. And I think this is a really critical component that it is the responsibility, not of the people collecting and doing this work who are already under-resourced. It is the responsibility of the people dictating the terms of the field and the data requirements we need to remember that this is not a costless exercise. Over, like rehauling data management systems, increasing data capacity, that is hugely expensive. And it's something that we're all required to really be cognizant of when we think about what we're trying to fund and what we're trying to do. So what I would say to Sophie's point is we all need to be very um, aware of our own biases towards not just English education, but also Western education and, and to acknowledge that there's a wealth of experience that's coming from the field that is excluded because of this and that we need to, to actively fund against that and increase data management at the level at which it's being collected, meaning we empower people on their terms, not ours. Um, 
Well, uh, I don't know. I think for you can follow so many steps and so many devices, but if I could just uh, uh, choose one, uh, I would pay attention to national and subnational contexts because uh, they are articulated. Um, so in order to develop better actions, better research and policies that fit, that fit better to the profile of the victims and beneficiaries, we have to consider this articulation. Uh, we must have deep knowledge of our beneficiaries to make decision properly, uh, because of course we are seeking to be more efficient in many ways. Uh, that is why uh, I have to insist that the data disaggregation, especially national ones, is so relevant because, as I said before, they are not able to show regional differences in terms of population, economic sectors, and migration flows. Uh, for instance, when we disaggregate national data uh, regarding to gender issue and slave labor, we realize that in some places, such as Sao Paulo City, the proportions are totally different from national ones. Uh, here, for instance, we have 30% of women being slave labor victims. This is, has to do with the fact that, um, that they are in textile sector, uh, they are being exploited there. And we conclude that more than 90% of these women are immigrants. So there are so many levels of profile and vulnerability that we have to consider, but we have to, um, uh, to focus also um, in the regional local context. And answering uh, one question that someone did about how can we use data research in the, uh, to influence policy, I would say that good public policies are always based in data, in research, because they show uh, which kind of beneficiary will receive these policies. So uh, for me, it's kind of nat uh, it's kind of natural that that governments and also civil society uh, follow uh, the follow a journey uh, behind this what data can show us so that's why it's so important uh, to look local level and see what they 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 bring to us i can add alice um in connection to to natalia and davina's points here on the underrepresentation of women in existing data analyses or matrix with regard to supply chains. So when thinking about the seafood supply chain, women are noted as being ignored, invisible, and un un unrecognized. And this is represented in how types of violations are communicated within seafood supply chains. And there is global indices such as Global Slavery Index and other indices that have an incredible amount of data at the, at the geographic level, assessing for geographic risk. Um, specific to the seafood sector, there's also the Seafood Slavery Risk Tool, which looks at the harvesting and processing segments of the supply chain and assesses for what rights have been ratified per country and what are the protections for fish workers. But interestingly, like there's other types of data. We think about um, qualitative data. So like case studies, survivor narratives, the investigations led by groups such as Greenpeace. And to Davina's point around the, the, the publication of this, you know, that's predominantly in English, how can we better account for different types of data sets to be aggregated together so that we can think about what's happening on land, what's happening at sea, what's happening at the global level, but also what's happening in small scale fisheries supply chains. And so with regard to what, what can happen, I think that there is a role of government and industry to mandate um, human rights due diligence throughout supply chains. So doing human rights risk assessments to better capture what are the gender disaggregated rights violations happening throughout supply chains and how can there be better visibility and how can this be mandated by government to ensure that they understand what violations are taking place and how they need to safeguard and protect those people within their supply chains.
if I can just try to add on to that, um, I think we have most researchers, I'm not trying to be biased, but I think most people use whatever information is there on paper. But when most of these policies are being made, when most of these um, terms are being constructed, people don't actually take time to go to the ground and find out what's actually happening. Most of the people, I can say, maybe from where I am, people use the information that is already there, but times are changing. Whatever, it, whatever stringent measures were placed maybe five years ago may not be applicable now because the people who you are trying to, the, the measures you're trying to use then, maybe the perpetrators you're trying to catch became wiser and changed format or something. Times change and things change. So I think people should try and renew measures try to find measures that actually work with regards to the changing times. And also at the same time, survivor's input is also essential because most of the people who work on these things have no first-hand knowledge of what actually goes on. Survivor input may enable them or may give them a different perspective, may give them a different set of knowledge that they may not actually have because it's their story. You're trying to protect me and maybe someone else from being in the same situation that I was in. So you need my perspective. I think it's essential to have my perspective as someone who was there so that I can protect someone else from going through whatever I went through. I also think it's essential to create awareness because most people actually don't know that this, these things happen. They, they think that maybe like back here, people think that maybe these are white men white man's problems. In Africa, we don't have that. In Africa, we work, work is part of who we are, but they're actually not. These are things that happen. These are things that affect people on a daily. So I think giving people this information will be quite essential. Involving survivors firsthand, because they're actually the people who, who know these things, experience these things, and ensuring they're safe and having their own safe space to, to actually tell their stories, mobilize other people, and their input when policies are being made, I think is quite essential in ensuring that we actually have policies that work. We actually have policies that are inclusive. They actually feel that their voices are also being heard. I think that is very important. Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're touching upon um, some points that are being raised in the Q and A, and that are real questions for me too, as as somebody who is working um, with Delta eight point seven and really trying to gather the best data, and also identify what's working. And I think um, one of the things that's coming out in the Q and A are questions about how we are how we can use this data to better um, craft a narrative that is more inclusive, it's more rich, um, and it creates more space for effective policies and remediation. And, you know, it's, I, I don't know if we'll have an answer to that today, but I think it's a, it's a really interesting thing to consider is how we use data, how we use survivor-led research to craft a narrative that can be understood and recognized by other researchers, by um, activists, and by policy actors, so that they have a more um, nuanced understanding of what works. And so I'm wondering, you know, if any of you can point to any um, examples of how um, something like that may happen, how there may be an opportunity to craft this richer story and get it into the hands of people who can then use it so that the focus isn't only on deep sea fisheries, but also on processing plans. Um, so that there is more of a focus on women traveling with their partners into these uh, regions where they may be subject to forced labor, um, but in a domestic realm. And also so that um, governments and administrators are gathering data that reflects a richer understanding of gender expression, of um, gender expression related vulnerabilities, which certainly exist. Um, if there's 
you know, one thing that you would want to tell somebody working in this field from your experiences? Um, you know, is there an actionable step that we can walk away with today? Easy question, I know. Go ahead, Natalia. <laughs> I saw you take yours off me. <laughs> you can go. <laughs> well, thanks, Alice. You know, I actually have to say that this is the first time that um, I know we at Walkery have published specifically on the dimensions of gender as it relates to measurement. And I have to say that I actually think this is the first step. I think laying this bare, putting this in an accessible writing format, not a peer reviewed journal that's gonna, that might take months and months to get this into the discourse, but we have it on the Delta 8.7 platform. It's a knowledge platform. We're making it accessible. I would say, given um, some of the things we can do right now, could look at automated, like it's not ideal, of course, but like a Google Translate type thing where people can automatically translate our publications into whatever, um, whatever language might be more accessible to them and, and then sometimes that happens naturally just based on the board the the browsers you use a lot of my browsers and i'm looking for things in french it'll even if the website's in english it'll automatically translate to the best of its ability so that's something that we can think about in terms of accessibility but i also wonder if this is the time for all of our organizations to make a gender commitment to say that in our work going forward, in our publications going forward, in our data analysis going forward, we lay bare a section that discusses the gender dynamics of what we're doing. And to be honest, we've been trending at Walkery in that direction for a little bit since the publication of Stacked Odds and our, our clear understanding of what that means. But I think that's an easy best practice and standard that we can start setting that when we publish our reports, when we look at our data analysis, along with the other caveats such as COVID-19 or Ramadan happened during data collection. Gender inconsistencies in measurement can be another caveat and needs to be another caveat that we raise because I know that when governments and other major funders look to fund projects in this space, they're looking at how to address those caveats and limitations. And so I think if we make a commitment now to think about being explicit in our work about how gender and measurement has impacted this and how we can make that more equitable and more um, more proactive. I actually think that'll be a huge accomplishment. And I think actually the symposium you've organized, Alice, is, is precisely the first step in that. Oh, I totally agree with Davina. Uh, what she said is uh, almost what I would say. And I think that, I mean, uh, we have to, to publicize and show data uh, this, in this way, easily accessible. Uh, of course, academic approach is important, but it, it's not accessible to everybody. So I think the, uh, that the attempt is to make information to get people and in order to show uh, to change the social perspective. Uh, because we have to consider that our institutions are very sexist, are very sexist as well, and so these institutions are responsible to do our policies. So we have to uh, day by day <laughs> change this perspective as well. Uh, institutions are not educated to consider gender issue in their policies, and even us, uh, civil society organization, have been educated to see and understand things uh, through a gender perspective. I would say that five years ago, uh, we also uh, emphasize the majority of men as the victims of uh, slave labor, and we did not consider women uh, as well. So we are changing this. So I think now it's better than before but we still do this exercise of changing things uh talking about this thing consistently because otherwise uh things will remain uh hidden so it's an exercise <laughs> uh, adding to that i think um firstly i think a, a sort of a recognition that this, you know, this is Delta 8.7, the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, every element from, you know, eradicating poverty to zero hunger, good health, economic growth, sustainable ocean use, which, which is the, the SDG we really focus in on, all of these elements have, there's a, there's a strong gender dimension, water rights are women's rights, the right to food security, that, that predominantly falls on women. And so I think 
mainstreaming, as Davina said, this kind of recognition that needing to mantle gender throughout our approaches. I think in connection to that and, and laddering up to these global commitments is that we need decentralized data hubs in all regions. And I think that this can be activated through better partnership models. So how can we have better partnerships between frontline groups, survivor groups, you know, international labor organization, decentralized hubs, academics, and through those collaborative partnership models, we'll be able to elevate different types of data from survivor narratives to case studies and better elevating those voices in the margins so that that can be aggregated together and we can have a better picture of how to direct policy. I think you're, I think you're muted, Caroline. Sorry, um, I was saying, uh, I think the fact that we are actually talk about it, talking about it is a step in the right direction. But most of the information that is out there already, or most of the information that is actually being written is usually in a complex language. Not everyone gets to understand the, the, the grammar that is used there, sorry to say. Most of it uh, is so complex that a common lady who maybe got only the basics of education may not actually get to understand. So I also think getting to simplify these things and using or being, being able to simplify them in language that can be accessible and understandable to just anyone <laughs> may also help uh, in getting to actually give people the knowledge they need. And not just talking about it, but actually trying to find measures and ways in ensuring that we are talking about it and something is being done about it. It's one thing to talk about it. We can talk about it here and just leave it here and then nothing is done. But talking about it and then having measures in place to ensure that these are the policies we did and we are trying to hold individuals liable to ensure that they're actually practicing whatever policies that or agreement they sign and they, they say they'll try to implement. Otherwise, I think we'll just be going around circles, making policies, having people agree, and then they're put in a backtrack somewhere, and then it's the same cycle over and over again. Talking about it is a step in the right direction. And as someone has said, empower me on my terms, not on your terms. You're trying to empower me and give me information then do it on my terms. Help me understand this, this gender imbalance. This is something going on. Help me understand why this factor or this aspect you want me to stop doing is wrong. You can't just throw it out there and accept everybody to embrace it. People will at times resist. Human beings don't take change easily. And there's a structure that people are used to. So I think for people to take women more seriously and for people to actually view women as their equals and women to get a, a voice, I think it's high time um, people are made aware, people are made to understand in their own terms, in their own languages, in whatever they actually relate to that this is actually something that has been going on. This has, these are the effects that have been there, not just to the women and the children, but actually to some of our boys and our men. And these are what they can do or help do so that you can create a better environment for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that's the, that's the real um, benefit is making sure that it's inclusive and that it's of benefit to everybody. Um, I, I just wanna end with a, almost a, a lightning round, just really quick question. Um, it's, it's elephant in the room. So we're one year into the global COVID-19 pandemic and we all have seen in various ways um, really tremendous um, negative impacts on the work that we're doing on um, the ability to collect data, on the vulnerability of certain types of employment and certain types of employment going underground. 
um, as well as on availability of funding and services for people who really need it. And I'm wondering, you know, going into this second year, what's like the one lowest hanging fruit research um, goal? What data and information should we be collecting right now in this next year as we're hopefully rebounding and building back um, to make sure that we're really building back better and that we're building back our research better? If I can jump in on that one and start, um, I'd like to say uh, we've always had a way where uh, our system through which our school systems have run, our kids have always been in school for the longest time. But now for an, a whole year, we had them home with us. Some are still home. So I think one of the major things we, use, we can start with is children. How has COVID actually affected them in terms of child labor, early marriages, FGM, because I know there, there are kids who are, have been married off. There are people who went through FGM and that made them ripe for marriage and they're not good, they'll not be able to go back to school anymore. They're, they're kids who are basically trafficked. They're kids who are, who've lost their families. I mean, in the last one year, a lot has happened and it's exposed the cracks we have in the systems that are already there. But out of everyone else, no bias intended, I think we can start with trying to find out how have the pandemic actually affected our children? What impacts has it had on the children, especially in low income families, where they were actually maybe forced to, because at school, you know, you, you, you might have two meals, but here you are at home. Your family is not able to, there's no work because everyone is on lockdown. So there's no food. Your parents may send you out to try help getting food. There is a suitor on the way. It will ease the family burden. I think these are some of the things we can start with and just try to find a sense of direction. What happened to our children during the lockdown? Yeah, thanks, Caroline. I, I think that's exactly right. Look, I think I, it's hard for me to think about data collection without thinking about the policy that we need to enact, right? So when I think about coming out of COVID and recovering from COVID, I want to know what's happened in terms of domestic violence rates. I want to know women that have left the workforce and have no ability to reenter. I want to know about those kids that haven't, that have been home, have been, been able to go to school and now are possibly on irreversible paths towards forced and early child marriages. I think um, partially by collecting data about this type of um, this this type of reintegration into normal SDG focused standards of living, right? Education for all, maternal health, um, the ability to eradicate forced and child labor. I mean, we also need to look very carefully at how deeply disenfranchised migrant workers and um, high risk workers across all industries have been throughout COVID-19. They've had minimum if negligible personal protection. They've had little access to being repatriated and turned home. I mean, like this has been an astounding time to expose all of these glaring inequalities that we've tolerated for very long. So I think the data collection systems we create coming out of COVID-19 will innately address these issues of women and girls in particular disproportionately leaving the workforce, being victimized, all of these areas of harm. But we need to remember that this standard of labor exploitation that we've accepted in global supply chains cannot stand. I mean, it cannot continue to be tolerated. And we saw that the very worst scenarios when people are not given basic rights to stay in a country, when they're not given basic access to healthcare and emergency assistance. I mean, this is a critical issue that we just cannot allow to, to stand. And I think by collecting data on this, we can prove definitively, not anecdotally, but definitively, that this was an entrenched and existing condition that we have every plan of eradicating moving forward. Um, here in Brazil, we have been informed that uh, domestic violence, for instance, raised so, uh, so much in the recent months. Uh, migrants are not able to get their documents anymore because we have this institution paralyzed. 
uh, women are losing their jobs here, uh, formal and informal occupations. Uh, and some of them, they are just given up uh, of their jobs because they have to take care of their families. Uh, so I think for the next uh, researchers, uh, it's very challenging because uh, we have to see how all this dynamic that is very chaotic uh, will impact um, conditions of forced labor here in Brazil. So I don't know how we are going to get data and how we are going to make all these connections because all these dynamics, of course, will have great impact in terms of um, labor market in, in next year. Now I'll just add very briefly, I think, um... Yeah, reiterating what uh, the panel shared, I think better data collection around the stark lack of social protections for women in the informal workforce or the migrant labor workforce um, in order to have more pointed policies to fill these gaps. Well, thank you um, to all of you and um, I, I'm really just thrilled to have been able to bring the four of you into this virtual room and have this conversation. Um, I, I just can't thank you enough. What I want to say is that this is the first conversation that we're having on gendered measurements of modern slavery, um, but it's not going to be the last. I think that we need to continue this conversation an hour wasn't enough. So, um, you know, please stay in touch. Um, thank you so much to all of you who joined us today. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day wherever it is. And um, do um, read the symposium if you haven't had a chance yet. Um, and please do um, stay in touch with all of us and with Delta 8.7, because um, we hope to be sharing a lot more of this in the future. So again, um, Caroline, Davina, Natalia, Juno, thank you. I really can't um, express my gratitude enough. And I hope that we will all um, be able to see each other in real life in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Alice, for being the mastermind behind this. Great work yes. pulling this together. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Natalia. Thanks, Davina. Thank you all. Thanks, and everyone that tuned in. Yes, thank you all for joining. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.